Uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Mark Stevenson. I am a grateful believer in Jesus Christ, and I'm celebrating the victory that Jesus has over the all the world. Many hurting people because we're believing the lies that the enemy is telling us. You know, it says that he's speaking his native tongue when he's lying. It's his native tongue. That's all he can do. So when you're hearing them accusations about not being good enough, and, oh, you loser, you fall and you're stumbling, keep getting up. Yeah, that's amen. my motto, eh? Keep, keep getting up. Keep getting up. Because that's the difference between the righteous and the unrighteous. The Absolutely. righteous keep getting up. Well, I have the privilege of introducing our uh, speaker tonight. I think most of you know our speaker. He's quite a troublemaker around here. <laughs> he ruffles a lot of feathers. Great man, everybody loves him. Um, and Daniel is sharing his testimony tonight for the first time here at Celebrate Recovery, right? Daniel has been involved in Celebrate Recovery for four years, and this is the first time you're sharing a testimony. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> you've probably been encouraging people for four years to share their testimony. Yes. <laughs> Well, praise God you're going to do that. You know, the scriptures say that we, God's people, have overcome the enemy by the word, of our, by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. When we share our testimony, like, this is a powerful thing. It really encourages everybody. Making us realize, hey, I'm not the only one struggling, because we're not. Everybody is, and everybody does. But there's also victory. Hey, you know, if Daniel can be victorious, I can be victorious too. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Praise God for that. Yeah. So, Daniel, would you come up and share awesome. your testimony with us? Oh, thank you. Um, I have a lot to read, so I'm going to read much quicker than I normally would speak or, or teach here, but um, please bear with me. Sorry. Get rid of all the stuff. <laughs> Hello, Forever Family. Hello. I'm a believer saved by grace who struggles with sexual addiction, intimacy, anorexia, and rejection. My name is Daniel. <laughs> okay, I can knock rejection off the list now. I'm welcome here. <laughs> um, you have seen me on the stage almost every week in some way or another. You have heard bits and pieces of my story. But tonight I stand before you nervous and vulnerable as I share the story of my life being changed by Jesus Christ, the impact Celebrate Recovery has had on me, and tonight for the sake of time my story will only focus on my personal hurts, hang-ups, and habits, my recovery, and my relapses, and where I am today and how I got here by the grace of God. Both my parents had been married before and had children from previous marriages. My mother had been told that she was no longer physically able to have kids. Three years before I was born, they received prayer, and someone encouraged them with a prophetic prayer about having a son. Over the next three years, they received multiple prayers, and people would even bring them baby clothes for a baby boy, and I have heard that the prayers even would get so specific at times that they were told they would have a son, his name will be Daniel, and he will be a preacher. Well, their prayers were answered, and God did a miracle. I was born into a Christian home, and we were at church as often as the doors were open. At the age of three, I accepted Christ as my Lord and realized he died and rose again for my forgiveness. Around the ages of four to five, I remember playing house or doctor with some of the neighborhood kids. Some of them were around my age, and some of them a few years older. At first, this all seemed normal, but quickly led to dark secrets that I later, with a therapist, recognized as sexual abuse. I remember feeling shame, even at such a young age. But as was the nature of my family, I kept things a secret. I learned that this was a trait I had seen modeled by my parents. During the ages of 5 to 10 years old, there were many family meetings called, and each meeting would expose a little bit more of the secrets that our family had kept hidden. Those secrets included things like previous marriages, siblings that I didn't even know about and I wouldn't meet till I was 25 years old, addiction in the family, abuse, financial struggles, mental health issues. 
All of these my immediate and my extended family dealt with. Some of these things are still not talked about among my family today. And if they are brought up, the conversation is quickly changed or the reality of these things is swept under the rug. During the same time period, I don't remember my dad around much. He was a trucker and often worked away from home. When he was home, he was often sleeping. And we were told to go play elsewhere so that we would not disturb him. This is some of the foundations for the feelings of rejection in my life. I felt that my dad cared more about work and that I didn't even matter to him. I do recognize my parents had many great traits and we had many great moments as well. But as we have all experienced, sometimes the negative experiences we have, no matter how big or small, build walls of resentment that we won't deal with for many years to come. I resented my father. I didn't want to be anything like him or have anything to do with him. At times he would try and reach out or connect, but I was hurt and I didn't know how to deal with it except to hurt him and reject him because I was feeling so rejected. Now around the ages of 11 to 12 years old, I entered my first of many dark times in my life dealing with depression and suicidal thoughts. I was not fitting in at school and I found it difficult to make friends. I was often physically bullied. Older kids would pick me up and throw me in the garbage cans. I'd often be tricked or pushed. There was one time I was held down in the bathroom at the end of a lunch break and whiteout was poured all over my face. I was in the bathroom for an over an hour crying as I would scrub my face raw trying to get it clean. There was also a lot of emotional bullying at this time with names and insults being hurled my way. Around the ages of 11 to 12, I also began to relive the sexual abuse that I had experienced years ago. The neighborhood kids would have secret meetings in sheds and garages where we would play games of spin the bottle, show me yours, I'll show you mine, truth or dare, and other variations of these games. Some parts of these games crossed lines and boundaries and left me once again fighting the overwhelming feelings of guilt and shame and the budding of my sexual addiction. Looking back, I realized that the greatest problem of all was taking place in my life. I was learning to live two lives. It looked like I came from a good Christian family and I did a great job of playing the role, but then I had a secret life of abuse, sexualization, fantasy, rejection, self-esteem issues, and of course, the guilt and shame. At the start of my teen years, I had a real awakening in my faith, and I knew the love of Jesus and had a real passion for Christian life but also had a similar but darker passion growing for my addiction. This is the two natures that the Apostle Paul often talks about, that our spirit is at war with our flesh. The world was changing. I remember my friends down the street were one of the first ones to get internet. It was not long and we were joking around in chat rooms and conversations would often be very sexual. This didn't take long before a group of friends would see naked pictures and eventually pornography. It also would only be four to six months later, and my parents would have a computer and internet in our own home. My room was downstairs in our house, and I loved the freedom and the isolation. This was great for both sides of my dual life. I would honestly seek God and pray and read and often spend all night in prayer or worship. But sadly, there were far too many times I would give up my give in to my own desires. I would often sneak to the computer during the night and spend three to six hours at night feeding my addictions. I never spoke to anyone about my problems. I never spoke about the past abuse that I had experienced or had caused. I kept managing my dual life as best as I could. The ages of 15 to 19 would be tough years for me where I would learn to grow up fast. There were rising issues at home. My younger brother had turned to drugs and alcohol and was kicked out of the Christian school we attended. My parents slowly started to return to an alcoholic life that they had left behind before I was born. They were bitter and angry and they left the church. The same church that I was saved in and raised in and now had started to take on leadership roles working with kids and younger teens. I loved the church. I felt accepted and welcomed. I was given opportunity to serve and to lead. But I still hid my secrets. I still hid my hurt, and I often hid the issues my family was facing. 
Those family issues escalated and I was told I wasn't welcome there because I would speak out against the alcohol, drugs, and issues that I felt were ruining our family. I left home and I would live in friends. I would go house to house so people didn't know that I wasn't welcomed at home and homeless. I also had church keys and so would spend nights at the church. Or I would sleep in my truck if I was not able to find a place that night. In the summer of 2001, I had just barely graduated high school. I took the minimum number of courses I could, and I took adapted and lower level courses and still barely passed. It was not that I was stupid, as some may have thought, but the sum of lack of sleep, moving house to house, not eating proper meals or even eating at all at times, and battling my addiction secretly on my own was all taking a heavy toll on me. I was also struggling on many levels with chat rooms, adult content, and even meeting girls from online. One night I found a Bible camp brochure at the church when I was spending the night there. I remember thinking, wow, this is perfect. I get a place to live, food to eat, minimal pay, and I get to just share Jesus with kids all summer. I jumped at the opportunity. I met a girl at the camp, and by the end of summer we were dating, and a couple months later we were engaged. I was still living house to house for a bit, but finally found a few places that would let me stay several months at a time. I began to attend Bible college in the church I was raised in, and my fiance was working several jobs at the time. Our lives were very busy, and often people would joke that we were the most single couple that they had ever met. Of course, this was a reflection that we were not often spending time together. Looking back, I now realize how big of a problem this was. This led to me struggling once again with my issues and addictions. I told her about my issues, but I did a great job of always making it sound like it was in the past and not a current struggle. The reality is my addiction was growing. Once again, I was juggling a dual life, a secret life, on a life of denial. I was telling myself lies and believing them. I told myself that marriage is the solution. Once I'm married, no longer a virgin, then all my needs will be met by my wife. I told myself that chat and meeting women is normal and just what happens before a guy fully commits himself to one woman for the rest of his life. All of these things were lies and foolish, but I was so deep in denial I couldn't even recognize it myself. I was married two weeks before I turned 20 years old. I was excited for a honeymoon and that all my sexual addictions would be broken and life would be amazing. This was not the case, as the reality of my sin was tormenting me. I was physically sick to my stomach and my nerves were shot. My conscience guilty, and I knew I needed to confess. We had not experienced physical intimacy as a married couple, and all I could think about was the wrong I had committed. Two days into our marriage, I finally broke down in tears and told her what was going on. I told her of my addictions. She stormed out of our hotel and I laid on the floor sobbing for hours. The flood of guilt and shame came rushing once again into my life. I felt awful for what I had done, for the way I had hurt her, and mostly for my disobedience to my Savior. I stood on the edge of the balcony of the 10th floor at the hotel and was prepared to take my own life as she walked back into the hotel room. This truly is the timing of God because I had never expected her to return. We went through our first year of marriage and just pretended as if none of the issues had even happened. We continued to be the best single couple ever. We put on a good show and people thought we were doing well, but behind closed doors we were both hurt. We both dealt with, with that through isolation, so often there was not much said between us. This was the early stages of what I would later identify as intimacy anorexia. My addiction had cycles and I would have time of sobriety and purity, but then times where I was active in online addictions. This would lead to my wife and I sleeping in separate rooms at times, and later in our marriage it would lead to cycles of separation. We started having kids, I finished Bible college and was brought on staff as an ordained pastor. I gave oversight to student ministries and was the chaplain of our school. I worked with students of all ages, and I taught courses in the Bible college, preaching at youth, young adults, and chapel services. I would often be preaching three to five times a week at various meetings that we had and was regularly a guest speaker at other churches and ministries in the city. In 2008, the church IT guy had discovered the websites I was visiting. 
It was brought to a couple of leaders at the church, and they decided it'd be best for me to attend a, a recovery weekend for every man's battle. I attended the program and thought, finally, it would be the help I need, and then I'll never have an issue again. Once again, I was in denial and wrong. The week was filled with group counseling sessions, teachings, <coughs> testimonies, homework, and so much more. This was the first time in my life I shared about my sexual abuse and fully walked through the history of my sexual addiction. It was also the first time I had encountered the Christian 12 Steps. With the Men from Recovery Week, we did a step study by phone for the next year. The step study had a lot of requirements, including homework, questions, daily calls and check-ins, a physical exercise routine, and much more. And the group saw a few men quit as they were not able to keep up with the recovery program. But I was committed and going strong. For the first time in my life, I was just shy of my first full year of sobriety. I felt myself getting comfortable and complacent. I felt I needed help as I was starting to push the boundaries of sobriety. I didn't know where to turn. I didn't feel I could turn to my wife because I was worried she would leave me. I didn't feel I could turn to the church because they had made it clear this program was supposed to fix me and that if I went into addiction, I would lose my job. Feeling there was nowhere to turn, I turned to the one thing that I knew best, addiction. I relapsed and went back into my own sinful desires once again. Things were getting at home, getting worse at home rather, with communication and isolating from each other. We now had kids, work, bills, layers of stress. Publicly, I was putting on a good mask, but behind it all, personally, I was falling apart. In 2010, I, I was caught once again by the church. This time I was caught regarding the chat aspects of my addiction. I was immediately fired and told I wasn't allowed to attend the service that Sunday as the pastor preached about the consequences of sin and then publicly announced I was fired. My wife kicked me out of our home and I moved into my friend's basement. I locked myself in a room for three to four days without food. He would often check on me, afraid that I may be ending my own life, as he knew the past struggles of depression, and he knew that this was the lowest moment of my life so far. I was depressed. I was alone. I felt I had lost everything, and worst of all, I had ruined the name of Jesus Christ. I was asked to be at the Sunday service the week following after they had announced my firing. I stood there in front of everyone, ashamed and unable to look anyone in the eye. I wept as I stood before the church reading an apology letter I had written. I was not permitted any form of severance and was not allowed to collect unemployment because of the way I was fired. I had no home to go to. I had no relationship with my parents or family. I had no vehicle, no job, no money. I'd lost my reputation as, what I had, as, as word of what I had done spread quickly. Friends turned their backs on me. I had nothing but Jesus. This was a very hard period of life, and I experienced great hurt from family, my wife, the church, my community. I believe many things were done wrongly during this time and may have caused more damage than good. But I kept getting up. I kept pressing forward by the grace of God. I was having no luck finding work, and I was barely seeing my children, and depression was hitting me hard. Finally, after almost six weeks of no luck finding work, there was a gentleman from the church and he offered me a job working at an oil change business. I had taught his children in Sunday school years ago, and then I was their youth pastor. And then finally, as young adults, they were on my leadership team. He told me he had always seen my work ethic and the impact I had on his kids and thought I would be a great addition to his business. This was the first glimpse of hope after a very dark and depressing place in my life. Someone believed in me. Someone cared enough to lend me a hand up and help me out. Someone saw characteristics in me that I didn't see in myself. Someone showed me the grace of God. After four to five months of separation, my wife and I had reconciled. Again, and I moved back into our home, and we immediately became pregnant with our third child. I continued to work at the oil change, and together as a family, we attended the same church I was fired from. We were told that the church wanted to work towards restoration of our marriage and ministry. Sadly, this was not the case, 
and there was really no steps taken or any system put in place for either areas of, of my life. After a couple years, a few slips in addiction and a lot of hurt and pain, we decided it was time for us to move from the area and the city we had grown up in. We were hopeful that a fresh start, a new place, a new chapter of life would be what our marriage needed and start building towards a future again. In the spring of 2012, we packed up our home and family and made the journey to Red Deer, the city we felt God was leading us to and still call home today. I found a job working in the oil field, but this often meant I was away from home for weeks at a time. It was also not the most productive environment for my recovery. The late nights, traveling day to day, different place to sleep each night, and time away from loved ones was all too familiar to my teen years. In fact, it was a repeat. In 2015, we were settled into our new city, now with four kids. We were enjoying a great church, building relationship and community, but behind closed doors, I was struggling on and off with purity and sobriety and the cycles of addiction. I began receiving emails from an old chat app that I was no longer using. At first, I ignored it because even though I had struggles, I truly was trying to fight my old nature and become a new man. The problem was I was fighting in my own strength far too often. I was still secretive and isolating and really living out the denial that we talk about here at Celebrate Recovery. The emails kept coming for several weeks. Finally, my curiosity got the best of me, and my pride told me I could handle it and not act out in addiction. I installed the app on my phone and found messages of a girl looking for Daniel. We began a conversation, and she said it wasn't me she was looking for, but I decided to keep a conversation going. And within a few weeks, things turned back to my sinful nature, and pictures and messages were exchanged. I woke up early one morning in April of 2015 and grabbed my phone like any other morning. I found I had missed 20, I had about 20 missed messages, 15 missed phone calls, and several voicemails. I felt my stomach sink knowing that something was wrong, but not having any clue what it could be. I began to sort through the message, many from a coworker at a new job I had just started where I would be home every night and be able to truly work on restoring my life to the Lord and my marriage to my wife. The messages told me that I had been hacked, that my identity was stolen, that someone was trying to ruin my marriage. I logged into social media to find that someone had created a new account in my name pretending to be me. They had invited my entire friend list, which was around 3,000 people, to become friends with this new profile. The profile contained my conversations with this girl from the chat app. It revealed inappropriate messages and images. They also took these images and they posted them all over the website and social media for my new job, for the church I was attending, the church I was fired from, and many churches across the nation where I had connection with leaders or had spoken in the past. I woke my wife up and I told her what was happening. And then I left the house. I drove and made some calls. My pastor and a close I called my pastor and a close friend as my emotions were running wild, and once again the overwhelming thoughts of ending my life were running rampant. It was clear to my pastors that my issue had been ongoing for most of my life and that cycles of addiction were being repeated over and over, that I needed help professionally and beyond what my pastor was able to give. I was encouraged to head to the States to meet with some of the top Christian counselors regarding sexual addiction. This week-long recovery intensive was a life-changing moment for me and the first steps in my current recovery. The program gave me new understanding into my behaviors. It revealed how my marriage was filled not only with acting out in addiction, but the intimacy anorexia that I had created and how I was now addicted to withholding emotion or connection from my spouse. I searched out recovery groups and began to attend Celebrate Recovery twice a week. I found it so hard at first. I was scared. I came alone. I didn't know anyone attending the groups, and I was afraid to tell complete strangers my struggles. I pushed on because I wanted freedom like I had never known before. I was reading recovery literature every day. I had an accountability team and was giving them daily detailed reports. I attended 90 meetings in 90 days, many of which were SAA meetings by phone. 
I was working through the many books I had bought regarding sexual addiction and intimacy anorexia. I was working with my pastors and the CR family. I was embracing the recovery journey I was on. A men's step study finally opened up about six months after I had been attending CR. I jumped in and with a group of men began to work through my recovery journey one step at a time. It was in this group that I discovered how much I was playing the victim in my life. That I was using the past hurt of abuse and rejection from my family as an excuse for my behaviors. I felt justified because of the rejection from church and friends to carry bitterness and unforgiveness. I finally was able to turn these things over to God and realize that yes, the past happened, but only I can decide if it will hinder me from truly living today, one moment at a time as our serenity prayer teaches. I decided to no longer play the victim, to take responsibility for my part and release forgiveness for things that I had no control over. It was during this step study that I realized I was playing God and I needed to turn my life and my will over to Jesus Christ and give up my illusion of control. This was not a perfect journey. There were bumps along the way. There were times I would arrive at group and turn in my sobriety chips and tell the group that I had acted out in one way or another. But for the first time, I experienced a community of believers that didn't reject me or shoot the wounded. They picked me up and helped me face reality and keep moving forward one step at a time. I completed the step study and I began to serve around CR. I was helping with sound and computer and setting up chairs or cleaning up the room after the night was done. I was eager to do whatever I could, not to earn a title or position, but because this program had given me strength and hope. I wish I could say that my marriage was recovering as well as my personal journey, but this was not the case. There was so much hurt in me and my wife. We still struggled with our lack of communication, isolation, rejection, and the stresses of marriage. After things had been so publicly exposed in April 2015, the people behind that exposure would not give up after that one event. There were several times that these pictures were made public, including a time that they were physically printed out and glued to the exterior walls of the church and school where I was formerly a pastor. There were months of harassing phone calls at all hours of the day and night. They would call my work, my church, calling and threatening my pastors and even my wife. We contacted the police, but we were never able to identify the people involved. These things each time would trigger a lot of pain in my wife, and she was often not even able to look at me. She resented me. She had no faith in my recovery because of the many years of lies and secrets. This would also trigger a lot of pain in me, and I would again be overwhelmed with guilt and shame, feeling I had no worth and no hope of a future, and have periodic slips with sobriety. We began to stay in separate rooms and lived more as distant roommates than any form of intimate relationship. As, as was common through our marriage, there was no intimacy physically, emotionally, or spiritually. In April 2016, we separated and began the process of divorce. We attempted to do this as cordially as possible to keep the kids' best interest as our goal, rather than to react out of our pain and our hurt. I moved out and I lived with a family from the church for a few months. I was told this could be a long-term solution that they wanted to help me. But after they met with my ex-wife, they came to me and told me I was only welcome in their home for three months. I quickly began to look for a cheap place. And I found a second job with a delivery company to create income for myself as a majority of my finances were going to ensure that my children and ex-wife were taken care of. My kids were crushed when I moved out and once again I was battling depression and self-harm. Thankfully during all of this I had built good relationships with CR family. I maintained my attendance at meetings. If you are new to Celebrate Recovery, I can imagine there is a lot of pain in your story, and maybe a lot you are even currently dealing with. I'd encourage you to not give up. Keep coming back. Do your part to build connection and relationship with this amazing family. Celebrate Recovery has truly become my family. They have helped me through many hard times and bumps along the way of recovery. I stand before you tonight sharing my story not because I am perfect, 
but because Jesus is perfect and continues to show me his unfailing love. Because I have built a community of broken people that have learned to turn their lives over to Jesus day by day and hour by hour. I stand before you today because Celebrate Recovery leaders and participants, Pastor Mark, continue to show me love and grace and to pick me up when I had fallen. In the last couple of years of my recovery, I've had the privilege to serve Celebrate Recovery. I've been involved in serving by greeting and ushering and set up and tear down. I've had the honor of leading worship and open share groups. I was invited to be a part of the core team as the assimilation coach for a year and was able to lead step studies and teach lessons here on this very stage. 18 months ago, I was asked if I would take on the role of ministry leader. I felt I was not worthy of this position and I was so scared. I met with the overseeing pastor and shared my fears and concerns with him. I openly and honestly brought him into my accountability team so that he could see exactly how flawed I was and that there was probably better people who had their life more together. But Pastor Mark believed that Jesus was working in me and able to do great things through me even if I didn't believe it myself. There's been times of honest confession and ups and downs, but God who began a good work in me is faithful to keep working on me until it is completed. Amen. I'm not the man I used to be, and I do not want to go back to that old life. I am not the man I hope to be, and I continue to embrace the journey and recognize that the journey is the destination. Amen. Next month I will receive a four-year chip to celebrate my commitment to a recovery lifestyle. To encourage others. Thank you. To encourage others that the journey is not always easy. There are no quick fixes. But to keep getting up. Keep doing the work. Keep allowing God to work in your lives just as he continues to work in mine. There are a lot of details I was not able to include in my story for the sake of time. But I hope that you find encouragement and see God takes our mess and gives us a message. He takes our tests and he gives us a testimony. He takes broken people like me and uses us to show others his goodness and his mercy. I'd like to end. Man, I almost made it the whole way. <laughs> uh, can't see if I'm crying. Okay. I'd like to end with sharing one verse with you and to invite you that if you are a broken person just like I am, there's a hope for your life. Jesus died and rose again, paying the price for our sins and making a way for each one of us to be forgiven children of God. Then he gives us strength by his spirit to keep getting up and heading the right direction no matter how difficult our journey looks. If you do not know Jesus and the transforming power of his love, please ask a leader tonight before you leave and begin your faith journey. Proverbs 24, 16 says this, Though the righteous fall seven times, they will rise yeah. again. My name is Daniel. I'm a believer saved by grace who struggles. But I'm committed to keep getting up and walking out this journey. Thank you for letting me share.